And good evening to everyone from around the world who is joining us uh, in this webinar this afternoon. My name is Paul LeClaire, and I'm honored to be the director of the Columbia Global Center uh, in Paris uh, at Reed Hall. And I'm delighted to welcome everyone to today's webinar on a truly timely, timely topic, Is Europe Democratic? This webinar is the fourth in a monthly series of broadcasts devoted to exploring six broad top issues of concern that will indeed perhaps define the very future of Europe. Each month in our series, one specific topic is considered twice, once in a francophone format through an individual, through an interview with a single individual expert uh, in Europe, and those are filmed in Paris, and then one in an Anglophone conversation between a group of experts located both at the University of New York as well as uh, colleagues in, uh, in Europe. This really important series was created by three Columbia University organizations, the Paris Global Center, the European Institute, and the Alliance Program, and in cooperation with our colleague formerly of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, Thierry Grier, who conducts the Francophone interviews. I'm delighted to welcome all of our distinguished panelists this afternoon, uh, and especially pleased to introduce and to welcome the panelist moderator, Eve Maney, who has been my friend and colleague, colleague, Eve, I hope you don't mind if I admit to this, for close to half a century. <laughs> Yves Meni is one of the most prominent and distinguished and prolific political scientists in Europe today. He began his career 50 years ago when I met him in Rennes as a professor of political science. He then moved to Paris where he had faculty appointments at Assas, uh, Paris Assas and at Sciences Po. From there, he went to the Uni European University Institute in Florence where he created a research center on European affairs the Robert Schumann Institute, and he finally ascended to the lofty position of being the president of the European University Institute, a, a post which he held for eight years from 2002 to 2010. The titles of Professor Maney's publications, books alone, not articles, take up three pages on Amazon books uh, today. They focus on comparable po politics um, and institutions on democratic issues, especially to, relevant to us today, uh, issues such as populism, uh, democracy, uh, and corruption. His latest book, Imperfect Democracies, was first published recently in France and has already been translated into Italian and Portuguese. And very, very soon, Roman Little and Littlefield will release it in English. Uh, Eve, thank you for joining us today, and I'll now turn the program over to you to introduce your colleagues on today's panel. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, for your invitation and uh, for setting this uh, very nice uh, panel of uh, experts, but also uh, for some of them friends or new friends uh, from, from today. So uh, <clears throat> we are here to discuss with four panelists, and I will start with uh, Nadia uh, Urbinati, who is a political theorist who teaches in uh, New York, and by the way, who is also an alumna of the European University Institute, and I'm pleased to, uh, to uh, recognize that we alumni have uh, uh, really <clears throat> done very well uh, in many parts of the, of the world. And she's a political theorist who, who has worked extensively on the issue of uh, democracy and representative government. In particular, uh, she has uh, uh, published uh, books on uh, de democracy disfigured, or uh, more recently in 2019, uh, a book which is a very fascinating book with a marvelous title, Me, the People. I think it's a wonderful, wonderful title, which tells a lot about uh, our times. Then <laughs> we have Ivan Krastev, who uh, works in, Sof in Sofia, where he's, uh, he's a director of the Center for uh, Liberal Strategies. He's also a prolific uh, publisher on uh, democratic issues, and is well known of, uh, uh, of 
uh, read of, 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 of uh, media in, in Europe and in the United States. His most recent publications include uh, The Light That Failed and also After Europe, which uh, has a new edition in 2020. Uh, then we have uh, two uh, academics who have a special quality. They have also been practitioners in one way or the other. Uh, Luc uh, van Middelhaar uh, from Netherlands is a philosopher, a political theorist, but he has also been in the staff of the first president of the European Council from 2009 to uh, 2014. And he has uh, published extremely interesting books, which are at the crossroads between uh, theory and <coughs> observation of the practice. Uh, Passage to Europe for, uh, is the first one, and alarms and excursions improvising on the European stage is the most recent publications. Finally, uh, Rui Tavares, uh, who is joining us from uh, Portugal, from Lisbon, is a former uh, MEP. So he has a strong experience in uh, European politics, and he has been in particular in charge of uh, a report on the, the problem <coughs> of uh, rule of law uh, and uh, in Hungary. Uh, that was published in 2013. Uh, if I'm not wrong, he has also been <coughs> a visiting fellow in the United States, and um, he might be able to uh, observe uh, from the spot in Portugal both uh, the strengths of uh, Portuguese politics, but also the warm which is in the fruit uh, since uh, Last Sunday, um, an, an extreme right <coughs> uh, leader has got for the first time in Portugal 12% uh, of, of the popular vote, which uh, is an indication of how uh, democratic systems are uh, shaken by the present uh, in the present times. So I would like <coughs> to propose to our speakers to divide to divide the time in three parts. And the first part would be to try to set a standard because the question is, is Europe democratic? And if we wish to apply a standard to Europe, we have to define the kind of standard we wish to apply. So I will turn first to, to Nadia and I will ask her if you, uh, if you wish to uh, evaluate the democratic intensity of the European Union, what kind of criteria would we apply? What is your definition of democracy? Nadia, do you hear me? Unmute me. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here and thank you for uh, this lovely presentation by Yves Mani. Um, well, well, intensity. <laughs> intensity sometimes is connected to the perception of the citizens and sometimes uh, is connected to the uh, deliver of the uh, um, output of the institutions. I would like to uh, go to the so-called, um, to, the, to, the, to the basic uh, con uh, elements that uh, make us recognize a democracy when we see it somehow. <laughs> So how can we recognize it when we see it? And I think that the modern tradition gave us some important reference points. First of all, a constitution. I know that it's very complex as a problem. Some countries don't have a written constitutions, uh, but most of European countries in the continent, they have a constitutions. And this constitution is divided in two parts generally. Uh, both physically and, some, and, and, and either physically or not, meaning a, a list of rights which are supposed not to be uh, infringed by um, cyclical majorities or governments, and the system of and the descriptions and the system concerning institutions, limitations of their own functions, 
And finally, the domains of political actions can be uh, the social or not. So uh, it's a kind of uh, pact uh, that citizens, bet better saying parties, they have signed in different moments of their history. They've changed through history, but constitution is connected to democracy in modern time. The other, the other important elements of democracy is representation, uh, which cannot be today, a, a de democracy cannot be even conceived today without a system of uh, electoral, uh, cyclical, regular, um, uh, a system that produces representations and representations uh, translates into seats in a parliament or in, in a congress, which has a specific power, the power of lawmaking. Uh, thus, this makes uh, the institutional side of the story deeply connected to the extra institutional side of the story, because representation is a kind of zip that on the one hand links and on the, one, on the other hand shakes the relationship between institutions and the citizens. Now, these are very important. So in some sense, institution is so elastic because it presumes a permanent going forward between uh, opinions and decision making, between, between uh, so-called moral legitimacy and legal legitimacy. So it's very crucial. Uh, so how can we then uh, at, uh, um, apply this concept to Europe? Now, the EU is certainly an object uh, of- uh, Nadia, Nadia yeah. may, may, may I interrupt you for uh, a moment? Yeah. Because uh, I would like to ask your colleagues ah, sorry. Uh, to, to join you or, or to dissent or to, or, to, or to complement before that we tackle the EU uh, issue. Okay, aspect. okay. okay. Then, just then, I, I want simply to uh, end with the, leaving aside the EU and by saying that democracy is both a form of government, institutional organization, procedures of decision making, and a system of opinion formations that pushes or reflect or directs and sometimes react against decisions coming from institutions. So these two legs, uh, they make democracy a complex system made of both institutional domains and procedural and uh, the broad, in, uh, not uh, organized or standardized uh, domain that we call sphere of opinion formation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Ivan, do you agree? Do you concur? Do you dissent? Ivan? Uh, even unmuted, I'm not dissenting. Uh, oh. So what <laughs> I, 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 want to, uh, I want to start is the fact that uh, the question is Europe democratic starts with the assumption that we know what is a democracy on the level of the nation state, but we are questioning what exactly does it mean on the European level. And on the level of the nation state, I do believe that I'll stay very much to the most minimalist definition uh, coming from Cheborsky and which I do believe basically gets exactly these key features that we're talking about. Democracy is a political system in which incumbent can lose elections and after losing elections is going to leave power. Because the very fact that the incumbent can lose elections basically suppose certain level of competition that is functioning. And secondly, you have elections. And thirdly, if you have elections, you can lose elections. And of course, this was uh, uh, questions uh, for several hours in the United States recently. After losing elections, there is no kind of a guarantee that you're going to lose office. And I do believe these three things are quite important when we ask the question, what democracy means in terms of government, how, how basically people are making choices. But I very much agree with Nadia that for the people, when you're going to ask a citizen what is a democracy, he basically is answering a slightly different question. To what extent I have the feeling that I can influence any type of a decision in the political community to which I belong. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will finish with Rui because he, he will make the natural connection between uh, the definition of dec democracy and the European Union since he, was a he is a former member of the European Parliament. So look, 
uh, you have been both, you are both a philosopher and you have been part of the executive of, uh, of the European Union. But as we know, the executive in the European Union is also a lawmaker. So uh, can you give your opinion? Yeah, I think, ah, thank, yes. you, uh, thank you, Eva, for uh, the introduction and, and for hosting us here. To all. I agree with the wise things which already have been said by Nadia and, uh, and Ivan uh, just now, and in particular also on the importance of being able to kick people out of office. That, this element of change, I think, is, is very important, um, which also means that if we zoom out first before zooming into your question, that dem democracy is a political system that is or at least can be good at adapting to changed circumstances because it has the possibility to change its leadership when it wants to. And of course, a very famous historic example is uh, when in 19, I think it was the summer of 1945, the British electorate decided to vote Winston Churchill, the great war hero, out of office because the war was over and they now need somebody else. They needed somebody who could, uh, in that case, build a welfare state. So that is a very strong feature of democracies as, as political systems, this capacity to uh, create organized uh, ruptures and, and discontinuities, which are not completely upsetting the system as a whole. But of course, that indeed points to a difficulty uh, within the European Union to which we will then, if I understand correctly, come later. But, but that is that there is no clear, identifiable government in the EU, no clear executive. There are a number of institutions who, of which one can say that they are part of the executive, the Commission, no doubt, the European Council as well, the leaders. Um, some other bodies as well, but let's not get in, into the details. But it is impossible to vote all of them out of office at the same time, uh, because the European Union is not a state, but a club of states with all their own national elections, to which we will also come later. Um, so you, you, you have cannot achieve this element of a great discontinuity. Now, is this a weakness or is this a strength? How many checks and balances do you need within a system? Uh, as Ivan mentioned, we have also uh, just witnessed some checks and balances in the US political and government system between the various branches uh, of government. Perhaps in the EU, there is too many uh, checks and balances and not enough possibility for the voters for citizens to achieve that change either, and I will conclude there by uh, visibly changing the direction of policies or very visibly change political personnel as a direct consequence of a vote. Um, I, I will stop here, but we can take it up later. Well, certainly, <clears throat> at a time where charismatic leaders tend to dominate the stage, uh, it's for sure the European Union is, is not uh, the place where uh, you have uh, a single leader dominating uh, uh, the other institution, at least it might, be, at, it might happen in national settings. So, Rui, uh, you have an, an experience as a parliamentarian. Uh, are you part of these uh, uh, frustrated uh, policymakers who consider that the European Parliament has not enough power, not enough influence, and that uh, actually is not the equivalent of a national parliament, uh, for instance? Well, thank you very much, Yves. Uh, well, actually, I'm not one of the most pessimistic or frustrated either mem members or former members of the European Parliament regarding uh, uh, that question. 
the comparison with national parliaments. I think that there's also a question about national democracy today, uh, that it's, uh, you know, the EU is indeed a club of democracies, each with its uh, uh, virtues and vices. But the question uh, is not only for the EU to resemble national democracies, be as democratic as member states, but uh, in a sense to be more democratic even than member states. I think that the, 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 the problem starts with having a definition of democracy that is too thin. And I'll start by remembering that the EU itself had a definition of democracy in the, in the uh, epigraph to the treaty establishing a constitution for Europe, because it quoted Thucydides and it said, our constitution is called a democracy because not only the few, but the, the whole or the, the majority of the people govern. Uh, there's a question, uh, a controversy uh, regarding if it's the whole or the majority. And that definition that was enough for ancient democracy and would today be subscribed by someone as uh, um, as, as little democratic as Mr. Viktor Orban, for instance, he thinks that the democracy is the regime where majority, where the majority rules, is not enough for us to ascertain what a democracy is. I, I like a definition by a, a medieval thinker on uh, democracy, Al Farabi, who is the missing link between ancient and modern democracy, the missing link be between uh, uh, Aristotle and Plato on one side and then the Renaissance on the other. And it says about democracy, a, a democracy is a group of people who agree to have virtuous ideas, we can say a constitution, who live close to one another in a place. There's a certain contiguity of experience. It can be wall to wall, i.e. in a city, but it can be tent to tent, i.e. in a caravan. Uh, it can be in a boarding house or in a home, so even a, a family home can be a democracy, if we so wish. It can be at the top of a mountain, it can be underground. We can build democracy if we decide to build democracy. Then he says, a democratic city is a collective city in which the citizens' goals, uh, the goal is to be free, each of them doing what they wish without encumbrance, and a, a, a democratic city, differently from the oligarchic city, the aristocratic city, uh, the plutocratic city, is a city that does not live according to one principle, to one ambition, he says, but is a city in which there is a coexistence of all the ambitions, all the different organizing principles that each of us, each of us has in his or her head, uh, have to coexist and mold the political experience of the city, uh, meaning that each of one will have a different definition. And because you wanted me to- plea for pluralism. And of course, it has to be a pluralistic city. Mm. Uh, and pluralism itself has to be pluralistic. It's not mm. only the pluralism of the, uh, uh, of the market, for instance, mm. but it has to coexist with other guiding principles for pluralism. So in order to give a link to the EU experience, there's a, quite a big difference between a contrast between answering is Europe democratic which it can be, and is Europe a democracy? So there's a difference between democracy as an, ad as an adjective. We can say that the EU is democratic enough, but the EU is not a democracy. And I will even say that the key word here is a, if it's a single noun. Whereas the United States, it's a little bit the opposite if we think about it. Nobody is in any doubt that the United States are a democracy, meaning a single polity that is a democracy, but if we read the criticism of US democracy, we'll hear that many people consider that the United States are not democratic because the, the big challenge for the United States is to create a multiracial democracy, which arguably the United States are, haven't achieved yet. And what we have to think is that what is the equivalent challenge for Europe? Europe may well be democratic or a club of 27 democracies with virtues and vices, but Europe still is not a democracy, meaning a transnational democracy, which will be the equivalent challenge at the European level to the uh, challenge in the US of creating a multiracial democracy. In the past, if I may add this, 
it was quite evident for, for some writers that Europe was already a polity. You know, you read Voltaire in the Siecle de Louis XIV, and the very first page he says, Europe is a great republic shared by many states. But today, we do not have the impression that Europe is a polity. We have the impression that Europe is an organization composed of polities. So that is the challenge, to create not a democratic Europe, but to create an Europe that is a democracy. Well, we have uh, a strong proposition on the table, and I would uh, uh, turn again uh, <clears throat> uh, to, to Luke this time and to ask him if he agrees with this proposal that Europe is not a democracy, but on the whole, Europe is democratic. Is it a, a, a definition that you could live with, or have you a different view, in particular given your own experience uh, also in, within the European institutions? Well, uh, let me then try to recapitulate. So Europe is not a democracy. I would I would uh, agree with that, because you, Rui, you seem to um, mean that since Europe is not a state, it is not a single political unity, it cannot be a democracy. So the question of the status, the state uh, features of the European Union seem to be included. And if you say, and that's the second element, huh? it's more forward looking, the teleological part of, of your proposition, Europe should become a democracy, then we are entering a discussion of whether Europe also should become a state. And then we enter a whole field on what that means, not only constitutionally speaking, but what it means for the democracies in the plural in the European Union. Let's say, what does it mean for the national democracies and therefore also for the quality of democratic life in the European Union as a whole, if we have a democracy, let's say at the federal level to keep it simple, um, but perhaps with the cost of, of uh, suffocating uh, the national democracies, which are also very important for the democratic self-understanding of citizens as having and being part of, of the government. So, so I think there, that's a tricky, tricky balance there. Don't, don't you think, Luke and, <clears throat> um, and Rui, that by, in a way, uh, accepting or, or, requi or requesting that there is a fit between state and democracy, we fall into the trap of the, I would say, the, the Westphalian paradigm, that is, uh, uh, a state is autonomous, is a nation, and actually democracy developed, historically speaking, within that framework, within that, that shell, and that uh, by stating that uh, in order to be them to have a full-fledged democracy, we we must have all the conditions which were requested or required for the national settings, and that uh, we enter into the, the 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 kind of discussion which was also put forward by the German Constitutional Court. There is no possible democracy in Europe because there is no European demos. If there is no demos, a single demos, there is no democracy. And I see that the, Nadia is a bit uh, nervous uh, and <laughs> I would uh, give her the floor to react to the pre two previous presentations. Uh, well, pos if I may just uh, you, yes. say to, to nuance, so yeah. that would be a reason uh, to drop the noun Hmm? for now mm -hmm. and focus again on, on the adjective for our discussion, okay. because otherwise we will be trapped in this dilemma. Although, a uh, final footnote, I don't know whether we are trapped in the Westphalian system or whether the whole world is falling back into it and that we may as well adapt to it. But, yeah. Okay, Nadia. Ah. We don't hear you. 
What so I was this? not nervous, but I was thinking within my head. And yes. uh, fortunately, you could see through my face, I'm not a good pokerist, uh, poker player, so myself. Now, the issue here is true, crucial, because um, you see, as soon as we start talking about democracy in Europe, uh, we have to drop something, to change something else, to specify something else, because it is really a strange animal, Europe, that does not fit our nation state-based conception of democracy. So even the word constitution with, with which I started is problematic because we have actually in Europe a kind of constitution, which is very functionalist, tells uh, us uh, to, is a kind of path toward some specific goal, but doesn't allow any kind of uh, principle of, of sovereignty like uh, in the national level. So, Nation, Europeans have many, many things in common, but there is not a nation or not a people, not a demos called Europe. So can we have a democracy without these two Westphalian or nation states? This is the real issue today. So I would propose thus to move the discussion uh, toward the um, forms of uh, federalization of uh, states or uh, um, more than club does, simply a little bit more than a club uh, and less uh, than a nation state, uh, although federalized, uh, a la US. Is it possible to imagine a, 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 a EU as a community? I don't know what does it mean, but it's a very medieval, um, uh, medieval concept in a, in a federalistic way, because federation allows us to do uh, many things, to have a diversification, uh, in relation to the single member states, although not too much, and to put limits on what is each single uh, member states can do with this uh, uh, political system. We can have different uh, culture and accept this idea of pluralism, of course, in a more stringent way. And above all, we can have uh, a very important issue we have to pay attention to, a, co a combination of si different sides big states, small states, uh, deeper populated states, less populated states. How can we manage to live together, although there are so different intensity of power and power in terms of uh, quantification of uh, territory and population? So we have to find a way to put the small in a condition of seeing themselves not uh, losing uh, power or um, in, yes, in power if they combine with a bigger. And this is the most important issue in my view. And one way of solving that issue has been the, to use uh, unanimity. That is to give the power to even one to block everything. But this is not a democratic process, procedure because it is a... Um, the, the, the democracy in, in procedure in uh, decision making wants majority. Uh, uh, veto for or unanimity gives the power to a minority. The minority is capable to block the decision. So that is a very contradictory way. How can we call a democratic a system that allows a minority even one to block the majority? So that is an issue to be paid attention to. The Americans have solved the problems with the two chambers and adapting the Senate to the equalization of membership and moving to the house or the diversification of power to parties. Now, is Europe going to accept this solution or not? Or is always ready to stay within this situation, which is, I would, I would, I would call it, a kind of social federalization, subsidiarity, but not political federalization. Um, so this is what like, I would like to pose as a problem to my interlocutors, particularly those who are politicians, in some sense. Ivan, uh, you are the director of a center uh, for the, I would say, the, the promotion of uh, liberal values, liberalism. So we have not yet talked about this important co component of democracy, which is, by the way, not, not only not democratic as such, but we have also to confess that most of the liberal values which have been inserted in democracies had as a, 
as a goal, as a target, the limitation of the pure democratic will of the people. It was a, it was a balance of the pure will of the people. So how do you see this mix uh, uh, which constitutes the essence of democracy, but uh, brought forward to, to the EU, EU level? Yeah, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, I very much agree with the fact that this, in a certain way, European Union is much more liberal than democratic because you have basically have a respect for the rights of the minority. You basically have an assumption that all European citizens uh, are going to have uh, the same rights in the different parts of, uh, uh, of the union. What you don't have, because uh, the idea of the liberal democracy, basically, I'm going to simplify, assumes three types of things, and they're slightly different. One, in the way that we know the liberal democracies these days, is uh, the right of private property. The second is the right of the majority to govern. And the third, which is the most rare right, is the right of uh, uh, the minority, basically, to have rights, to feel equally protected. And I do believe that what European Union is offering is the rights of the minority to have rights. And from this point of view, it was quite important. What it is not giving is basically the right of the majority to govern because the idea of the majority in the European Union has a very different definition. What is it? Majority of states, majority of people. And I'm saying this because normally we're going to agree and the colleagues basically have made these points very clearly that the very existence of the European Union is pushing us to change our definition of democracy but the, strangely enough, the, the very existence of the European Union is pushing also us to change the notion of democracy on the level of the nation state. The nation states within the European Union are not democracy in the way the states outside of the European Union are, because many of the decisions cannot be taken by the majority and the decision of the majority of the voters. And I do believe these tensions between the liberal principle and the majoritarian principle, not by accident, it is strong everywhere and we can see it everywhere, basically the rise of majoritarianism, but in the European Union, it is very well articulated. And I'm just going to give you one example to try to show how the existence of the European Union is making it really uh, difficult uh, uh, for us to try to rethink all these uh, uh, debates. For example, imagine that, for example, in place like Austria, there's 30%, of the foreigners who are living in the country, many of them members of the other EU member states who do not have the right to vote on the European elections, on the national of Austrian national elections, regardless of the fact that they're paying their taxes in Austria. And on the other side, I have the right to vote on the Bulgarian elections while being in Austria, I'm not paying the taxes there. So strangely enough, this kind of a, how you're defining political community, this type of a much more integrated idea of democracy where basically no taxation without representation and so on, all these kind of a classical concepts in my view is questioned both on the level of European Union, but also on the level of the nation state. And I do believe here is the kind of a major tension. Classically empires can offer rule of law and they can offer rule of laws of a very diverse communities. They make people equal in front of the law. What they're not giving people is basically the feeling of the majority rules. What the nation state was very good at giving is that majority rules, quite often at the expense of the minorities, uh, it was much more difficult to give this type of a, a liberal principle. And I do believe that part of the crisis that you see in the European Union today is very much the tensions between the liberal principle and democratic principle. And when you go basically and talk about developments of some of uh, the different European uh, Union member states, you're going to see that probably this is the divide that we're going to decide also the future of the Union. But this would be a question for uh, each of you, uh, since we are uh, <clears throat> following even uh, discussing the, let's say, the, the, the mix uh, uh, which compose uh, the, all democracies, the mix between, uh, uh, let's say, uh, the will of the people on one hand, the direct expression of, of the will of the people, and uh, liberal components uh, which are uh, of various uh, nature from uh, uh, division of power, checks and balances, rule of law, protection of human rights, uh, uh, attribution of powers to, to, 
to to independent authorities or, or judges or, or central bankers, etc. So we have a mixed bag, and we perfectly know that this mixed bag is different from one polity to the other. American democracy is not the British democracy, which is not the German democracy, etc. So, the, so could we accept not to replicate uh, the national model, which by the way, is so different from one country to the other and uh, accept the idea that the mix could be slightly different and unique because we are working at the European level. So the question is not so much of a democratic deficit as it was uh, stated by David Markham in the 70s, but uh, a, de a different democratic setting, a different democratic uh, and evolving setting because democracy is, is an evolving uh, system. Look, you have experience uh, within uh, the techno structure of, uh, of the European Union. So, yes, it, this, this tension uh, is very palpable. Huh? And I think really we are getting here into the heart of the matter this, this tension between the liberal principles and functionalist principles as well, which Nadia mentioned before, on the one hand, and the will of the people or the majoritarian principle on, on the other hand. And I think really, well, we are saying it, but we cannot stress enough that the EU has really built, been built from the start almost exclusively on the liberal functionalist principles. Mm -hmm. uh, in the mind of the, the sacred founding fathers, there was no word for democracy. They, they didn't care. Huh? Of course, uh, people also in the French context, like quoting Jean Monnet, who famously said, and then I do a tremolo in my voice that uh, we should not uh, unite uh, or build coalitions between states, but we should unite les hommes, huh? the people. Mm -hmm. But he was not talking at all about democracy or about the voters. Mm -hmm. He was talking about the guys he knew. He was talking about networks he had in, in, in Paris and Bonn and New York as well and, and, and Washington. So that is really the DNA of the European Union. There is not a democratic element. And the deal European citizens cut out of this with the EU that has been built with all these independent institutions you mentioned, I think was an acceptable deal perhaps until 15, 20 years ago. But as the European Union is entering more and more controversial, deeply political policy fields, a currency, a shared border, power politics, relations with Russia, with the US, with Turkey, there is a, I think, a public call, deep public call to have a clearer expression of the democratic will in the outcome of policy decisions. And uh, the system, I guess, resists it huh? uh, because it, it, it creates uncertainty it is at odds with the very strong legal and functionalist uh, working also of the institutions. But what, and I, what I find interesting, and I, I will conclude on, on that for, for now, is that the public very recently in the pandemic, which we are now experiencing, has in fact found new ways to make its will heard without going via formal routes. But if we think back, well, about 10 months, huh, there was a call for help from Southern Europe, from Italy, from Spain, to Germany in particular, and to the European Union to do something, huh, to act. And this was not about, um, about a discussion about competences, whether the European Union does or does not have enough to say in the field of public health. But it was just a public call for solidarity, which was so strong that nobody could the resist. Powerful, it was so strong that call that the most powerful politician of Europe and of the European Union, the German Chancellor, could not resist it. Mm -hmm. And she had to heed that call. And there, the public, 
uh, the joint citizens or a majority of them have shown that they can really change the direction of where the European Union is going and something which was not possible 10 years ago and I was there at the time during the Euro crisis. Uh, Eve, thank you for reminding me of that inglorious episode. Um, whereas now there is an expression again of public opinion, not directly in the ballot box, but simply in a public sphere which is emerging, mm -hmm. uh, changing, changing policies. I think that there's a very fundamental change. I think, Luke, you have uh, implicitly underlined <clears throat> a very important factor of democracy building, which is time. Uh, uh, there is not a single democracy which has, which is democracy today. We started as a democracy. Even the, let's say, Britain started as a representative government, uh, France and the United States as republics, not as democracies, as republics. And uh, after all, uh, if I may add a footnote, I don't think the situation is so bad after, let's say, 50 or 60 years of uh, European integration. Uh, in particular, um, if the, the popular pillar is still too weak, the others are extremely strong. Human rights, rule of law are extremely strong. So, so I would ask you perhaps at that point of the debate, had you a suggestion in order to strengthen uh, a democracy in the making? Because from what I hear from all of you is that uh, we might have doubts about the intensity of uh, the democratic character of the European Union, but none of you had uh, doubt about the fact that there are, there are very strong uh, democratic elements, but not enough. You have mentioned one, Luke, which is the entry, not in the capital, but the entry of the people into the public sphere, into the debate. Huh? Uh, and uh, Nadia, uh, have you, uh, would you have a, a suggestion, uh, a proposal to make in order to strengthen the democratic character of the European Union? Well, as I said at the beginning, I see democracy, uh, representative democracy, contemporary democracy, as having two legs. I call it diarchy, diarchia, because there's two kinds of authority, two kinds of authorities. One institutional making laws according to the tradition, that is a state making or a sovereignty making and so on and so forth. The other one, I come from the tradition of Habermas in this case, it is the informal spheres of opinion formation. The question that Habermas gave the sense of inf informality very strongly. Now we can, and we are invited to, I agree with the, uh, we look at the, the, the question of COVID brought this problem to us uh, in front of us, to give this um, public sphere a more, um, um, not structure because it's too much, but certainly an articulation that people can feel to be capable of, of having a, a voice to be heard, critical voice, not simply of monitoring the institutions, but giving input to the, the. So what we need perhaps, it is at the European level, a kind of, uh, mm, power, the Romans were so good to create institutions, uh, the ancient Romans, an institution for petitions, a place, a, 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 um, a power thanks to which or, or because of that we can have uh, the sense of communication, of making our pro problems, our means the public without any specification, nationally speaking, a kind of voice. This uh, during the, co the COVID, this was uh, held through the, the government. Each government of each state was so active in making the voice of their public heard. Perhaps we need at the European level, uh, since we don't have a party, so we don't have a strong political organization institutionally, this kind of uh, network 
of uh, uh, capable of attracting our voice and capable of communicating it to the institution. Uh, the internet and the new system of communication may allow this more easily now than in the past. So we have to think in terms of transforming, but insisting on that leg that is not jurisdictionally strong or defined as the leg connected to sovereignty, because we don't have it. But the other one can have important articulation and richness, but some, uh, uh, some you know, uh, engineer, institution engineering are needed here. Yeah, but your your comment, uh, uh, Nadia, <clears throat> reminded me that uh, the uh, ancient Greeks, uh, in essence, were extremely proud of their political system, and what was making the difference, according to them, was the fact that people could speak and deliberate, which and so the the Greek problem. Uh, five centuries before Christ is still there. Um, and we have to say that uh, there was an aspiration which is uh, translated into the Lisbon Treaty by the so-called citizens' initiatives, which has been transformed in a bureaucratic nightmare. It does not work. And there are not uh, two million uh, different instruments available in order to channel uh, the communication. But certainly that the citizens initiative, which was a good idea, has been transformed really in, in, in a failure uh, uh, through the resistance of governments and institutions. So, but you insist on communication, deliberation, uh, uh, and I think indeed it's, it's quite uh, important. So, uh, 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 Ivan, have you, uh, you are more on the side of liberalism, but uh, have you some, some proposals to make on the side of the pop popular expression, which, which, is, which is still lacking? No, I do believe that uh, uh, there's three things which I do believe it's quite important to get why people are becoming so nervous and when the system went in crisis. One is that even when you talk about elections, you can see that last years, you have more and more the spread and the proliferation of a different type of a political protest. You can feel it everywhere. And one of the important thing is that what is interesting about the elections is that elections has double role. They're kind of mobilizing the indifferent, but they're also trying to calm down the very committed and intensified. So what elections are not representing in politics is how much people care about certain issue. Mm. And from this point of view, paradoxically, and the more you have this one issue movement, one issue kind of stories, which try to make the point that for them, this is life or death issue. Be it climate, be it migration, it doesn't matter what it is, but I do believe this representation of passions, not representation of interests, was very much trying to find its way, not so much through deliberation, but through this type of a street politics that is proliferating even when you have the COVID and basically expect people to stay home. The second thing that I find an interesting paradox is that if you see the history of the European Union for the last 30 years, particularly if you see it from the East, the paradox is that we are getting more and more freedoms, but at the same time, you have the feeling that you are less and less powerful as a voter. And this is real because many of the decisions are taken in a level that basically you cannot affect. And I do believe that this is important to understand that one thing that most of this majoritarian minded leader are trying to seduce the voters with is something that is real. They're telling them, listen, look at all these liberal principles, look at the division of powers, look at independent courts, look at independent central banks. They're telling you that nothing could be changed. So in a certain way, the best about liberalism that when you're losing elections, you're not losing much is translated as you cannot change much. Your vote does not matter. And I do believe Mr. Kaczynski on this basically even uh, uh, had a kind of an important term that he managed to point legal impossibilism. 
he goes to the voters and said, why are you going to vote for me when I can change nothing? When the independent bank, the courts and the European Union are not going to allow me to be able to deliver to you what I'm promising you. And I do believe this tension is very real. This is very manipulative uh, because the leaders which are empowering themselves has a very strong message to their voters. If I don't have the power, you don't have the power. And this tension is there. And I do believe this tension is not easy to be resolved strictly, simply through consultations uh, because the idea of the European democracy is democracy without majority. And uh, this is the interesting issue. This is indeed a constitutive tension of democracies. And I would like to ask Rui, uh, who has disappeared from my screen, but I, I'm pretty sure he's still there. Uh, Rui, uh, you have the experience of, uh, as an MEP, uh, what would you suggest in order to improve, let's say, the democratic leg uh, the, uh, of the system, uh, not, the, not the checks and balances leg, but the democratic one? What, what would you suggest in order to improve things? Uh, well, thank you, Yves. And now, now I understand why I, why I was left out of the last round. So I don't know if you allow me just to, uh, before I answer that, just to answer some of the points that Luke and others made on my initial proposition very quickly uh, in order to delimit what I uh, uh, intended to say. I don't think that in order for Europe to be a democracy, it needs to be a state. It also does not need emphatically to be a nation. In one sense, that would be the easiest task or mission, you know, the kind of resurgiment or question of we have made Italy, now we have to make Italians, we have made Europe, now we need to make Europeans, and then we will have an European nation state that will be a democracy just like the nation states before it. Well, some federalists and European uh, Republicans like, uh, for instance, Robert Menasse, the, the, the novelist, they do posit that in order for us to have an European democracy, national democracies must die. I emphatically disagree with that. On the contrary, I think that we can only save national democracies if we have, uh, if we democratize the European polity uh, as a polity multinational and, and shared by many states, as the quote by Voltaire in the siècle de Louis XIV said, uh, European Republic shared by many states. The national states must not disappear and they must not cease to be democratic, but we do need to rise up to the challenge of creating something new. As you said in one of your questions before, the history of democracy is to democratize what was until now undemocratizable when the founding fathers of the United States created a republic at a multi-state level Montesquieu told them that a republic could only exist at the city level and in a nation you had to have a kingdom and in a multinational setting you had to have an empire. So they created something that was impossible before and we need to create this new kind of democracy which is not a state but a multinational transnational democracy. Now for suggestions in order to, to, uh, uh, to change that. Uh, here, I think it, come, it really comes to the fore the, different in, the difference in political traditions between the European Council, from where Luke had his experience, and the European Parliament, where I had mine. Because the European Parliament is not only born out of the experience of uh, uh, Monet and Schumann, I like my Schumann and my Monet and my De Gasperi and Adenauer, but also of Spinelli. The kind of, you know, uh, make democracy first and democracy will create the demos kind of strategy. Go public, no, do not go uh, uh, step by step, as Schumann said in his declaration, but be bold and first create the movement and the movement will bring awareness that we need an European polity to solve the kind of large scale problems that we have today. Indeed, without, you know, member states uh, can be all the, you know, uh, uh, majoritarian Democrats that they want, but they will not solve climate change. They will not solve tax evasion at the global level. They will not so solve the kind of global problems that we have in the chains of production today. It, it is quite impossible. Only at the European level, we have a kind of a hope of, of solving that. So first thing, we have to give people objects of political desire. This is something that is lacking in the European demos. 
whereas Americans can have, you know, very different objects of political desire, but they have objects of political desire at the federal level, you know, $15 minimum wage or uh, uh, Medicare for all. We don't have that kind of objects of political desire in Europe. Because it is. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I think I think the, the European citizens have uh, desires. Mm -hmm. but quite often, they don't fit with the functional uh, requirements of the so-called constitutions, that is the treaties. Because yeah. yeah, exactly. So, whereas on one hand we do have to do some uh, uh, small institution democratic changes like you know electing the president of the commission or maybe you know uh, uh, electing the permanent representatives in the council of the eu you know uh, which would uh, in the end be a senator senatorialization of the council of the eu and this can be done at the national level like portugal can decide to elect the permanent representatives like oregon did when senators were not elected in the us but in in the last analysis, what we need is to create uh, the public sphere, the European public sphere. Here, I agree with all you know, the previous uh, speakers. Uh, people need to feel that they have a reasonable possibility of effecting change if they want to. Some people are already do now uh, do that now. If you are a Max Schrems, you know the young Austrian guy who took Facebook to the European Court of Justice and won. He feels that him alone can create, can affect change. But most of the Europeans don't feel that. Uh, so I would, for instance, create places, real brick and mortar agoras in the capitals of Europe in the form of European libraries where uh, we could have discussions like this, multilingual with the new uh, technological tools that we will have in the future where people can, you know, uh, uh, turbo change that kind of you know citizens initiative that you talked about. I will change in the European Parliament. This is quite simple. You have uh, pilot projects that one MEP can present up until four million euros. You could change the rule and say that MEPs can present uh, 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 pilot projects, but also uh, twenty thousand citizens, which is much more feasible than an initiative with one million can also present a pilot project uh, to, to the budget committee of the European Parliament, and then it could be implemented. So you need to, by peace and mill change, uh, by peace mill change, you need to create several avenues for participation that will give people the notion of their power. Up until now, we have representation without taxation uh, at the EU level. We don't pay European taxes. We do have European representation. We should. We should. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe we should because it would give us a, a you know skin in the game so mm -hmm. to say but uh, uh, after all this is done what is still missing is that we don't have uh, uh, european pan european media we don't have pan european newspapers we don't have a pan european debate maybe this will emerge out of the pan european problems that we do have but at this point this is one of the biggest uh, challenge that that we have. I will finish with a short story. During the eurozone crisis, I once I once caught a cab in Brussels, and the cab driver was very much against the people of the south, like you know, the lazy, indebted southerners that are uh, wreaking havoc in the in the in the euro area. And me, being a Portuguese, I you know raised my hand and begged to differ and proceeded to tell him, you know, our side of the story. And then he said, hmm. Where can I read about that? And I didn't have a question. I, I didn't have an answer for him because actually he couldn't. There was no single newspaper or TV channel that he could access in Belgium that would give him the other side of the story. And as in the South, we also did not have the other side of the story. It was all mediated. And this is the big problem, I think. Yes, we, there are still a lot uh, uh, of uh, problems and difficulty. Uh, so, but. Uh, we have heard a few uh, hints at what could be done. And uh, after all, the lessons that we can draw from these uh, various contributions is that uh, we, uh, we need, as I said, we need time. We need uh, to be uh, quite um, empirical in, in what we do. Is there is not a, a perfect constitution wait, waiting for us. 
Uh, but uh, before uh, opening the floor to the questions, I would like uh, to ask Luke if he has uh, one more addition to, to one contri additional contribution to the debate on, on this point. No, uh, well, I think I, I opened the floodgates uh, on the theme of public sphere, which uh, other speakers have picked up. And, and perhaps this is also the moment for us to open our mini agora uh, we have here in the forms of Q&A or chats or what have we, but so that we have our own mini uh, public sphere okay. with our audience. Okay. Uh, oh. we, can, we can speak for another half an hour and it would be great yeah. to hear the other viewers as well. Um, I have a, a question from Christy Landfried. Uh, or comment uh, uh, a colleague from Am uh, Hamburg. With regard to the cr criteria of democracy, Nadia uh, rightly mentions the importance of a constitution. The European Council has decided in 19, 2019 there will be a conference on the future of Europe, taking up proposals of Emmanuel Macron and, and Ursula von der Leyen. Do you think it would make sense as uh, a follow-up of such a conference to have a new convention or constitution for the EU? So do you think a, a, a new convention? By the way, um, have you heard of anything concerning this conference uh, uh, on the future of Europe? No. Nadia? Well, it takes a lot of time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> They're on the brink of starting it for, for, for months now. And I think the project is still to be finished next <laughs> year under the French 2022 presidency of the council. Mm -hmm. so. Well, no, certainly moment of crisis, uh, something good can uh, can develop, and this would be could be uh, going back again to this attempt to create or to give us common rules uh, or a basic condition for a noble path among the many uh, countries or people. Um, well can be done, of course. Uh, what kind of constitutions, what kind of state uh, organization, then we are back uh, again to the resuming the, the issues that was, uh, you know, dropped uh, out uh, several years ago. Uh, at least to create a discussion, uh, a general, broad, you know, kind of democratic uh, conventions, broadly speaking, uh, without uh, any formality. You know, I have in mind the Iceland uh, uh, model in which there was a kind of a mix between uh, formalization like elections, but also um, through uh, media or internet or socials to create together, you know, the, probe, the uh, basic issues for um, making our rules. This would be a could be perhaps an interesting moment of uh, uplifting uh, the sense of uh, belonging to the same community and give us ourselves some important um, uh, institutions that allows us to be and to feel more democratic. By the way, if the parliament is our condition, because we uh, Europe is a kind of um, parliamentary democracy as a model, the question would be also to see the relationship in terms of members of parliaments and the commission. There is no obligation now for the member of the commission to come from the parliament. And yet this would be interesting because if you have the same members of the parliament or the commission to be part of the parliament, the parliament and thus the institutions of elections would acquire or would have more power. So there are also in, 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 in this um, existing situation uh, possible transformation that can uh, um, uh, strengthen the institutional uh, organization of democracy, which is parallel. Uh, <clears throat> I have also um, uh, other questions uh, which uh, uh, concur in, uh, in, in, in stating that perhaps should we need some forms of direct democracy within the European Union, which has something which has not been mentioned by anybody, actually. Do right. you exclude legislative initiatives or referenda? Well, in my view, at least, uh, since I am a little bit, uh, you know, uh, mm, 
cold in relation to direct democracy. Uh, but some some forms direct initiative in the proposing law proposals, yes, could be an interesting uh, referendum. Uh, I don't know. I I, I have some uh, coming from a country in which uh, the problems exist. Uh, I, I I suspend. I don't uh, want to have any kind of <laughs> final uh, yeah. opinion on that. I don't have it actually. Yeah. Um, Can I also make a point on this because. This it's yes. interesting. Uh, it is very, in my view, risky to have a pan-European referendum in the absence of a European public space where basically people share language and a discussion. Because if you believe that normally people can say only yes and no, you're going to create an instrument that can block certain decisions. I cannot basically see at the same time what kind of a particularly positive agenda it is going to be. Uh, and, and this is... This is something that uh, I'm slightly nervous about in general. Uh, the very idea of a democratization of the European Union is perceived as a go and not as an instrument. And the instrument is that people should feel represented. And part of the story which you have in Europe today is the crisis of the output legitimacy of the democracy. People don't believe that they're getting what they should get. They're unhappy with certain decisions being done. The fact that you're going to give much more participation to the people does not mean that you're going to solve the output uh, uh, legitimacy. And from this point of view, my feeling is that now the elites are very interested to give kind of a much more representation to the people and much more participation, but also as the way to shy away from certain type of responsibility for basically giving them what normally is already in the treaties that is basically already offered. Uh, and this could be, this creates a democratization for democratization's sakes when it comes to a different popular instruments, which people normally are going to like, but not necessary to participate. And this is also my last point on Rui. You said that there is no common European television newspaper, and you're absolutely right. But even in the United States, where you have a language and they have basic uh, 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 televisions, the story is that you see much more fragmentation of the public space even on the national level. So there is no demand for this type of a social cohesion uh, that we see and probably we're creating a kind of illusion for our own, believing that the very moment is going to exist, people are going to demand it. Uh, there is a question <clears throat> which is uh, quite important and um, uh, about uh, the, the demos. Can a democracy exist without a demos and most importantly without a, com a common language? If I may, I would like to perhaps to address this, uh, this question because uh, first of all, we have many examples of, uh, of democracy where there are several languages which are uh, in use. For instance, uh, Switzerland, Switzerland is the case in point. But I have also to say that, um, first of all, uh, most demos as we know them today are historical constructions. Yeah. It's, it's, there was, I mean, they were very rarely a demos already existing before it has been created, constructed by force to, uh, in many senses. But I, I would like also to, to, to uh, give an example of, <coughs> um, of diverse, uh, diverse languages uh, could exist within the same uh, polity. There was a, a study by a, a, a British sociologist, historian sociologist, uh, Zeldin, uh, a study on, the on France at the end of the 19th century. And according to the estimates, the reports of the uh, inspectors of national education, about 70% of the population of the French population, the most centralized state in Europe, 70% of the population was not speaking French. It was as simple as that. And however, we were living under the third, at the beginning of the third Republic. So I would not like to uh, make uh, the absence of a, a, a strong demos, a, a, pr a preliminary condition for the construction of, of, of democracy. There is also another question, and I think I would uh, uh, finish with that uh, question. Uh, 
uh, which about the debate says, this is assuming perfectly informed and rational citizens and their representatives. What about populism, identity politics, fearful, emotional, reactionary, reactionary thinking? Uh, yes, we are in, immersed in, in all these uh, patience and, and, uh, and identity politics right, right now. So uh, uh, I think some, I think it's um, even where mentioned uh, these, uh, the importance of, uh, of, of patience, of the, of the, of, of the street, uh, of street politics, uh, do you wish to answer, to address this question, Ivan? Yeah, thank you very much. And I also want to take the very important point that you're making, and I totally agree with that all kinds of the demos that we see now were not demos some time ago. And they have been created, and they have been very much created in a certain type of a straight framework. But what is changed is now, strangely enough, people have the idea of what democracy is based on the nation states that they know. It is one thing basically to create a democracy without demos in the 19th century, not having a common language. And it's totally different to believe that you have a model that you know what democracy is about. And I'm saying this because uh, when you see particularly now in Central and Eastern Europe, and there is a lot of talk uh, about uh, the rise of majoritarianism and liberal democracy, and this very much ethnic understanding of the state. It has a lot to do also with a certain type of a demographic changes that we are seeing, which are very much creating uh, and coming with the European Union. We like to talk about how much people have been moving all the time, but what we are not seeing is that in 20th century, people have been moving a lot, but the societies and the states were becoming more and more ethnically homogeneous on the level of the East. Mm -hmm. The biggest difference now between Eastern Europe and Western Europe is the ethnic composition of societies. And this is part of the paradox that is behind some of these democratic issues that we're talking about. If you look back, in the beginning of the 20th century, and you see the ethnic map of Europe, you're going to see two Europes. One was multicultural, multi-religious, much more diverse, and it was the Habsburg Europe. And the other was much more kind of ethnically homogeneous, and it was France, it was Germany. Century later, this is just the other way around. Uh, and I do believe this kind of identification with ethnicity and democracy that basically the demo democracy should belongs to a certain ethnic group. I do believe this is an important kind of attention that you can see in Central and Eastern Europe. And from this point of view, when you see it, you, and we talk about some of these uh, populist governments and regimes, this is kind of uh, a certain thing that we see also in Israel and other places. You're ready to open society, you're ready to open the market, but you want to be sure that democratic majority is going to be ethnic in its composition. Uh, and I do believe this is something that is kind of a now creating a huge pressure on, on the European Union, particularly in a moment in which you have a huge depopulation and loss of population in many parts of the world, and you're going to have a major demographic changes. And I do believe this is at least of what I'm seeing from the East is going to be one of the major kind of a sources of uh, populist politics and this type of a rise of majoritarianism that you can register, not only in Poland and Hungary, but in many other countries. Well, perhaps a, a very last uh, question um, that I will pass to uh, Nadia, because I, I'm sure she will be pleased to uh, address this question. Is the term representative democracy the dic dictionary definition of an oxymoron? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this, uh, if we assume democracy as the Kratos of the demos uh, that does decisions by themselves, of course, this is a, a, an oxymoron. It's also the fact that, think about that, democracy is a Greek name, doesn't have a Latin uh, uh, equivalent. Representation is a Latin name, doesn't have a Greek equivalent. So democracy representation is a kind of combination of two systems Republican and democratic, which were not supposed to be identical, and people over there they didn't feel that they were identical, and they are, uh, and through the time, through uh, the centuries, they've been merged in some sense. So even today, we know that democracy is a monocratic uh, kind of uh, one demos, 
the Republic is, is uh, two uh, sovereigns, the few and the many, or institutions and the people, so even today. So I think that representation, although oxymoronic from the classical conceptions, uh, it is uh, an important instrument of democratization, particularly beginning with the 16th, 17th century. So uh, historically speaking, our modern democracy became uh, a claim for uh, universal suffrage, a, came, a claim for um, constructing representative institutions or parliaments. So uh, we have to consider that the history, democracy has an history, Democracy is an history, and if this is the case, historical transformation is part of the game. So yes, of course, in the uh, dictionary uh, is uh, oxymoron, uh, but in the construction of democracy is not. And today we can see that democracy is a system of representation, and representation is a way of interaction, constructions of uh, uh, claims, identities, political identities kind of, and change. So with the reflection of uh, parties, kinds of movements, kinds of, in looking for a way of unifying the many, but also pluralizing them. So I think it's a mix of process of unification and process of pluralization. And in this sense, it's, uh, it's uh, our uh, better um, fit for democracy in today's uh, in today, uh, history. If, uh, I don't know if I can... Tag along with just one short, one short point. Okay, um, I think that you 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 have argued, you have pushed back very well against the 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 idea that only if you have a monolingual demos you can have a democracy. We can even turn the argument around. We look at Brazil, which is a monolingual continent country, and the diversity of the social experience between. Uh, cities and the Amazon in Brazil, it's much wider than the diversity of experience between, you know, Lapland and Lisbon in Europe. So actually, there is a great homogene homogeneity of European experience, uh, regardless of the difference in languages. And of course, we have India with many languages. But I also want to push back against an argument that even made between input and output legitimacy. I think that the EU actually generates lots of output for the EU citizens. Freedom of movement, single market, the currency in our pocket in certain countries, funds, structural funds, cohesion funds, Erasmus, so on and so forth. The problem is that precisely because you don't have an European democracy, you let national governments define the terms of the debate and kind of erase the experience of the output that there is at the EU level. And, you know, generating the kind of, of, of uh, um, you know, setup where you can have the Brexit debate, where actually many of the Brits didn't feel that there was an output coming from the EU. So if they didn't feel there was an output on public goods coming from the EU, it was easy for them to destroy it and say, you know, nothing will change. Actually, a lot changes. So if we have a problem is actually in the in the in the input side people need to feel that they have skin in the game taxes uh, uh, more representation more participation and also uh, a cohesive myth and will this I, i'll end in the 30s what was really uh, um, effective against fascism in the United States was the creation of the, what I would call a para-constitutional idea of the American dream. The American dream is not in the constitution, is not in the declaration of the independence, but is in every American citizen's head. There is I an American say, dream. I would say Barack Obama, the, the promi uh, promised land. <laughs> and that's where I wanted to get. Yes. Yes. We must recreate the idea of an European promise. And we have to go back to history and tell people that when the European promise collapses, bad things happen. And well, then I'm... we will be prepared for a clash of narratives between the populist, the national populist, pessimistic uh, narrative and an optimistic European narrative of a shared European promise in order to create a European polity that can solve problems at the global level. Thank you, Rui. Uh, I am sorry because uh, I have uh, uh, I've been a, a 
uh, rather bad at uh, controlling the, the time. We, we were supposed to conclude and to finish by uh, 8.15, it's nearly uh, 1.30. But uh, first of all, I would like to thank all the, <clears throat> the experts around the table who have discussed the uh, democratic issue uh, at the EU level. It has been an extremely uh, stimulating and fascinating discussion. And I would like also to thank uh, Columbia University, the Global Centers, Paul Leclerc, who has uh, been uh, the invisible hand uh, behind this organization. So thank you, uh, Nadia, thank you, Rui, thank you, Luke, thank you, Ivan, thank you, Paul, and uh, see you next time when the pandemic will force us to have uh, uh, another seminar, another discussion. Thank you very much. Paul? Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. You've been a marvelous panel. Um, a, a deeply, deeply important conversation, I think, on, on many different fronts. And so uh, all of us at the university, and especially our partners, uh, not only the Global Center in Paris, but our two important partners in organizing and creating this series of uh, six debates, uh, the, um, the Columbia European Institute and the Alliance Program, are very grateful to you for having given us your time and, and, uh, and your genius uh, and your rich thoughts this afternoon. Uh, we're like, we've had 150 people attending this, uh, wow. this webinar from people from all around the world. And tomorrow we'll have the breakdown by, uh, by region, um, uh, by nation, uh, by continent. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see the, uh, how many different countries within the EU had persons attending us. But we have another one coming up, our fifth, and that will take place on February 9th. The question being debated at that point is, is there a European identity? Yes or no? Uh -huh. Big question. Uh, so <laughs> we hope that you'll join us uh, our, uh, for that, our panelists. And um, we hope that many, many people from around the world uh, will enjoy that program as well as our final program uh, the month afterwards. Paul? Uh, Paul? Paul? Yes. Yes. Uh, I am really very sorry. There are a certain number of questions which have not been addressed. Is there a way of uh, collecting these questions and pass, pass these questions to the panelists? They might choose to answer. I think there must be a way to do that. Yeah, I don't know, but if, because <laughs> I have to apologize, we have uh, still about a dozen of questions which have not been addressed and it's a pity. Yeah. We have a, you're, you're absolutely right. We have a, 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 and that's very gracious on your part. We have a marvelous staff in Paris and they'll figure out a way of doing this. Thank you, thank you. Finally, um, please join us through the Global Center's website um, uh, to, to find out much more about what we're doing uh, on a daily and on a weekly basis. And let me conclude by thanking not only our co-founders uh, and co-creators, but a number of other Columbia University entities that are our co-sponsors. And it's a long list, so just let me take a couple of moments to read it. The Columbia Alumni Association, the Columbia Maison Francaise, the university's libraries, the Institute for Ideas and Imagination, the European Legal Studies Center at the Columbia Law School, Le Grand Continent in Paris, La Maison de l'Europe de Paris, and Sciences Po American Foundation with additional support from the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union and the advisory board, the donors of the Paris Global Center. So thanks to them, thanks to you. Thank you for all our participants uh, for coming and joining us this afternoon for this webinar. And we hope to see you all again uh, in, uh, in the next month for our next program. Thank you and goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>